All right, dearly beloveds, we're here today, gathered here today to talk about rootstocks on deciduous fruit trees. Um, there are other videos that we've done talking about the anatomy of a fruit tree, its parts and their function, and uh, how to select a quality tree. And that'll be displayed at the base of the screen you're viewing now. But what we've got here on my left and right um, is an apple. Uh, and this is a, a really nice variety of Macintosh called Empire Macintosh. Um, and it was bred uh, in the Empire State, New York, at Geneva Testing Station associated with Cornell. And ironically, it's probably the best performing of all the Mac types out here in California. Um, and it's, uh, it's a gooder, uh, the fruit that is. There are issues, it's a tree that needs some coaxing to establish a uh, tree size. Um, uh, doesn't always branch well, so you, you really have to stay after it in growing it. And I also have a pear, so an apple and a pear. Uh, this is a, a French variety, as most varieties of pears have French origin, uh, called Danjou. Uh, and it is probably one of the more reliable, highly productive of all the uh, uh, pears. Uh, and it's on a, uh, uh, both of these trees are on semi-dwarfing rootstocks. Okay, let's kind of pause for a sec here and talk about rootstocks. I'll go back a little bit and do a little touch up on uh, parts of the tree, uh, tree anatomy. Uh, the managed tempered zone deciduous fruit tree is actually two distinct genetic individuals fused together via budding or grafting. More commonly in the industry, budding is used. More commonly in the home garden, grafting is used. But 601, half a dozen of the others. So you have the top part of the tree, which is referred to as the scion. S-C-I-O-N, just fancy talk for offspring. Uh, uh, you could say the scion Empire Macintosh or the scion Danjou pear here. And then you have the root stock. The rootstock is the what's called the shank, the base of the trunk from this point down and the entire root system. Uh, you see this little uh, funky uh, bulbous swelling thing here. This is the point of attachment of the two genetically distinct in individuals, the scion and the rootstock. Rootstock scion, rootstock scion. Let's look at talk about rootstock and rootstock effect a little bit. But also let's look at look at how cleverly we've tied these trees down so they won't wander off into the sunset here. Uh, uh, but uh, let's look at the two different root natures of apples and pears. And that is to say, apples have many fiber surface roots and they spread more horizontally than vertically. And pears have these kind of finger-like roots that go down quite deep. Deep. Um, as these trees break out of dormancy and start to grow, they will have, these are more rather than less the brace roots that support the tree. And off of these brace roots will be lots of tiny little white short feeding roots. And those are the roots that suck up, as it were, water and nutrients and grow the tree. So slightly different root nature, apple to um, uh, pear here. And then let's talk about rootstocks in, in, in general. They have a number of effects on the tree. The primary one we think of is tree size. And there's a whole range of rootstocks from full side, often called seedling, which will basically grow you a 30 foot tree, maybe something you want, probably not, um, down to uh, the mini dwarf. And that would be a rootstock uh, called M27, an apple rootstock. Give you a nice dwarf little tree, you know, four by four like that. And there are quite a number of steps along the way, gradients as it were, along the gradient um, uh, for uh, different uh, sizes of trees. Uh, so rootstock affects the tree size. And you want to think about that as per how much space you have to fit the trees in, your spacing in row. Uh, but also you want to think about that in terms of care, ease of care, etc. Uh, the trend, and I do not disagree with it these days, is towards pedestrian orchards, ladderless orchards. So much easier to care for a tree on the ground not having to use ladders. So what do you get from rootstocks? You get the What's the principal thing is, what is the size of the tree you're going to go, grow? Uh, another thing about rootstocks, and it's pretty 
much again a gradient. The more dwarfing the rootstock, the more what they call the more precocious it is. And precocious means coming into bear in this instance, coming to bearing and productivity, fruitfulness early in the life of the tree. The joke maybe being a lot like Mozart, a rather clever lad who was very precocious and wrote sonatas at the age of three to five or so the story goes. So the more dwarfing the rootstock, the quicker the tree will come into bearing. Uh, an example might be a, a full size apple. It might take eight to 10 years to have any fruit on it, maybe 15, 20 years to reach full production. Uh, whereas a semi dwarf uh, apple would probably give you some fruit in three to five years and between five and eight years be a full production. Uh, there's another thing associated with dwarfing rootstocks um, and that is um, that the more dwarf the rootstock, the smaller the tree, the higher its yield efficiency. Now yeah, the 30 foot tree will give you more pounds of fruit than the 8 foot tree, but if you were, and people do this, to analyze the volume of the tree canopy and its ratio to the pounds of fruit, the more dwarf tree is more production efficient. You'll get more fruit per that volume of canopy. Uh, the other thing is you can get quite a bit more trees in, in with dwarf than with standard. Like with one standard 30 foot tree, in that same space you could get four to six semi dwarf trees. And that they come into bearing earlier in their life, they're precocious, and that they have a more efficient uh, yield in terms of pound per area of canopy. Uh, well, semi-dwarf trees got it all going. I will offer this word of caution. Uh, one is there are more different gradations, steps along the way from full dwarf to full size with apples than with any of the other fruits. And I would caution you about being careful with really dwarfing rootstocks. And for example, the P series, which came out of Poland, P22 uh, and uh, M27, uh, uh, it came out of a uh, English uh, testing station, Malling in England. These are trees that are, as described, give you a nice dwarf tree. They are, in my mind, maybe bred to be more properly grown or easily grown with chemical fertilizers powerful, fast-acting chemical fertilizers, maybe not so much with organics. So sometimes you have trouble getting uh, tree size, tree vigor, and production with these very dwarfing rootstocks. And they have very little tolerance for missing water. So something in the mid-range. So in the realm of apples, again, as mentioned, uh, the P-series, uh, uh, M27, these are very dwarf uh, rootstocks. Bump it up a little bit, M9, maybe give you a six, seven foot tree like that. Um, and then you get into the semi-dwarfing category. And I think this is the safest place to go in terms of, yeah, it dwarfs a tree, pretty much. And uh, uh, yet it's got enough inherent vigor that you have to fuss over it all the time like that. And one, if I, if I had one go-to rootstock in the semi-dwarf department with fruit trees, it would be uh, M7. Uh, Give you a tree, if it's a weak variety, eight, 10 feet tr tall. If it's a strong variety, 10, 12 feet tall like that. And let me just say that the size of the tree imparted by rootstock is genetic. It's just built in. And yet you can also control the size of the tree with pruning. Not a ton, but some. So uh, think about it uh, like that. So you've got tree size, you've got precocity, you've got yield efficiency and then uh, on the flip side of the coin uh, the more dwarfing the rootstock the shorter the life lifespan of the tree now this is all relative so the full size tree will live a full size there are apple trees down in the Pajaro Valley in Watsonville south of us here in Santa Cruz that are 125 150 years old pretty long life there are reportedly pears in the hills of Tuscany that are 200, 250 years old, pretty long life. So as you come down to the more dwarfing rootstocks, the lifespan is going to be shorter, but it still will be 75 years or so, maybe 50 to 75 years. Uh, but dwarfer trees live less long uh, like that. So uh, sometimes the issue comes up, well, 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 how do they do it? How is it these various rootstocks controlled tree size. And if we're talking about dwarfing rootstocks, it really goes to the roots, the, ex 
the nature of the roots, the extent of the roots, and the efficiency of the roots. Trees on dwarf rootstocks have less root mass. They have less efficient uh, roots in terms of taking up water and nutrients. They have narrower conductive uh, uh, vessels, xylem, to draw that water and nutrients up to the soil. But enough to dwarf the tree, but not enough to stunt the tree uh, like that. Um, and uh, all this has come to us as a marvelous gift from uh, basically from uh, uh, plant explorers originally and uh, subsequently researchers at universities around the world. Um, they have just uh, uh, first, sometimes throughout history, going back to antiquity, uh, reportedly Alexander the Great found these really cool, very dwarf apple trees in the mountains of Iran and Iraq and had them sent back to Macedonia. And these were the genetic material for, for propagating and then breeding a lot of the dwarf apple rootstocks that we now have. Um, subsequently, uh, as I said, uh, major universities around the world, experiment stations, ag experiment stations have done uh, breeding. Um, and. Uh, once they get something that they like, that is, yes, this controls tree size and its productivity is good and it is resistant to various soil pests and diseases, then they clone it. They propagate it asexually and increase it by the thousands like that. So you want to give some thought to what size tree you're going to get, and that is largely imparted via the rootstock. Uh, secondarily imparted by the inherent vigor of any given variety. I'll use as an example in terms of varietal vigor, one of the great, most exquisite, difficult to grow, apples in the world, Cox's orange pippin, arguably the weakest scion or variety. And then I'll use uh, the ubiquitous and rightfully so Fuji apple. It's a, uh, it's a cascading waterfall tsunami of a monster tree like that. So if you put the, co the timid co English Coxus orange pippin on any given rootstock, it'll be appreciably shorter than the Fuji on the same rootstock. Uh, mixing and matching of varieties and rootstock, tree size, vigor, and all that jazz. Um, what are you going to do? Well, this is uh, shameless self promotion. Turns out I wrote a book. Turns out I've got it right here. Uh, Turns out it's called Fruit Trees for Every Garden, and it's got an extensive section on rootstocks. In fact, uh, page 41 here is a, a good listing of the prominent uh, semi-dwarf and dwarf rootstocks for apples. Uh, so it'll tell you well, what is his name, M M111. What is the expected height of the tree, uh, 15 to 20 feet? And what are some of the adaptabilities or qualities or demerits of it like that? Um, so it's, it, it's good to know what to expect in terms of tree size. Uh, and again, to match that with uh, your uh, variety, is it strong, is it weak? You put weak varieties on stronger rootstocks and vice versa. But another thing that can be helpful is that uh, most reputable nurseries will have two tags attached uh, to the tree. Uh, and one is just dis naming the rootstock, M111. And again, then you can reference uh, what you're going to get from that. And the other, which is like just this little card here, is just a full of information. One, what a pretty picture of the Empire Macintosh and, of course, a promo for Dave Wilson Nursery. Probably one of the more distinguished nurseries in the world. It's in the uh, Central Valley of California. And let me read Empire Apple. Crisp, sweet, flavorful, aromatic Macintosh type dessert apple. Dark red blush over green or greenish yellow, sometimes fully dark red. Widely adapted, including climates with warm late summer nights. Early season harvest about one week after gala. Small to medium sized spur type tree, good pollinizer for Mutsu, Gravenstein, Winesap, Jonago. It is uh, for easy care and harvest, the tree may be kept about uh, 10 feet 
tall. Uh, and then an important bit of information, it tells you the estimated winter chilling hours required for this tree to perform well, and that would be in the case of the Macintosh here, uh, 800 hours. I've got a little uh, graphic here. A uh, couple of fellas who, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind sitting down and having an adult beverage and kicking it around about fruit trees. Forche and McKay out of Cornell, Geneva Testing Station, 1970. They did a lot of research and they used as their prototypes an 8-foot apple tree and a 15-foot apple tree. And basically what they found was uh, it's about resource partitioning. The dwarf tree partitions about 70-80% of its resources into fruit and only 20-30% into wood and leaves. And, and the tall tree is just the opposite. Uh, so they did a lot of research and they verified this. And one thing that kind of cracks me up um, is they know this to be true. They do not yet know the causative mechanism. And it kind of cracks me up in science writing. Um, if they know the causative mechanism, they are going to go on for pages and pages and pages and give you it down to the cellular level. If they don't, they just say, at the present time, the causative mechanism is unknown. <clears throat> okay, let's move on. All right, good luck. <laughs>